All right, everybody, if you just hang on for one more minute, we'll let a few more, a few others in and we'll go ahead and get started. Hang on one second. Okay, I show 401, so let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. This is the, the first uh, pregame press conference for the 2021 Subway ACC football championship game. And we're pleased to be joined by Wake Forest head coach, Dave Clawson. Coach Clawson, if you could just start us off with an opening comment and then we'll go to questions. Uh, when we go to questions, please use the raise your, your hand function. Coach? All right, well, thanks uh, for being here with us and thanks for covering uh, the ACC championship game and, and Wake Forest football. Uh, we're extremely proud of all of our student athletes, coaching staff, administration to be able to represent uh, the Atlantic Division, the ACC championship game. Uh, it was a, a big win for us yesterday against BC. Obviously we knew a, a lot was on the line and just proud of the way our team prepared uh, executed, focused, and, and ultimately performed. It was one of our best all-around performances. Uh, it was probably one of our best defenses performances of the year. I thought we were really good in the kicking game. And uh, offensively, uh, we just continue to play at a really high level. Uh, and it was uh, just a great day for our program to have so many Wake Forest fans go all the way up to Boston. That section was huge and loud. Um, and certainly on our sidelines at times, it felt like a home game, which was, uh, was really neat. I have a good college buddy of mine that lives in Boston. And he sat in the same seats that he did when we went up there in 2015. Uh, in, in and it just, the whole rooting section looks completely different. I mean, there was, probably less than 100 people there or 200 people. And then I'm sure we had a couple of thousand there yesterday. So uh, we're grateful uh, to, to all those people that made the trip and supported us. And it means a lot to me and our players and, and our entire program. Uh, obviously, uh, we, have, uh, we know how good Pitt is. Uh, I have great respect for Pat and Arduzzi. Pat and I have been friends for close to 25 years. Uh, I was the offensive coordinator at Villanova in the mid nineties, and he was the defensive coordinator at Rhode Island. Uh, and we certainly stayed in touch through the years about all different things, um, coaching, recruiting, um, you know, Pat's a good guy. He's an excellent football coach. You know, the, the irony of this game uh, for me is I grew up as a, uh, a Pitt Panther football fan. Uh, my dad is a graduate of Pitt. And we'd go to one or two games every year back in the 70s. So I grew up uh, with Pitt football. Matt Cavanaugh, Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, Ricky Jackson, Hugh Green. Um, and I was a diehard Pitt fan. And I can still remember when they won the Sugar Bowl and the national championship in the early 70s. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a neat thrill for me career-wise. Um, to be able to, to coach against the team that I grew up rooting for as a, as a young kid. Uh, but uh, he's done a, a great job there. Uh, obviously, Kenny Pickett is an excellent quarterback. Uh, Pat's always had a, a really good defensive team, very aggressive with how they play. Uh, he's got excellent assistant coaches. You know, I've known Mark Whipple for a couple of decades. Uh, Randy Bates, I knew him when he was up at New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, the special teams is extremely well coordinated. So uh, this will be a tough game, uh, but we're really excited to have this opportunity and to head back to Charlotte and, uh, and play for an ACC championship. Thanks, Dave. All right, we're going to go to our first question. John Dell, uh, if you can just unmute your line and ask your question. Yeah, Dave, uh, you guys uh, and Pitt are obviously two of the highest scoring teams in the country. 
are you pretty comfortable in, in a shootout? I know you guys have been in shootouts. It seems like every other game, but you got to feel pretty, uh, pretty confident going into a game that, you know, could be 45, 40 or whatever. Well, I don't know. I, I'm kind of hoping we can get a few stops. So uh, it'll be hard. Uh, they're excellent on offense. And, I mean, Kenny Pickett is just a, a phenomenal player. And, and we played against him early in his career uh, in 2018. Um, and he's just gotten better and better. And, you know, his decision to come back uh, obviously has paid off for, for him. You know, he's, he's one of the, the very best quarterbacks in the country. Uh, he's got a lot of weapons with him. Uh, they're very gifted at receiver and at running back and they're physical on the O-line. Uh, their tight ends are huge and have great hands. Uh, so it's not just him. And he'd probably be the first person to say that, but he is certainly the engine that makes them go. Next question is for Connor O'Neill. Connor, go ahead and unmute your line. Hey, you mentioned uh, a few weeks ago playing NC State that they look like uh, the most balanced team you guys had seen this year. And I'm wondering how Pitt stacks up against that and, and whether this is kind of, I know it's not the same team, but if this is a lot of the same balance that you saw a couple of weeks ago. I mean, Connor, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's Sunday. And, you know, on Sunday, we come in in the mornings and the first thing we do is try to to clean up the BC game. And we first try to fix us and what didn't we do well and what are the things that we need to work on. And normally if I wasn't doing a press conference now, I start doing my deep dive on Pitt. So I've certainly seen Pitt. I watched him on TV last night. Um, but you know, that's why I like our doing our press conference on Tuesday is I feel I, so, I know so much more about the opponent on Tuesday than I do on, on Sunday. So uh, I know their record and I know Pat and I've watched them and Kenny Pickett and, you know, certainly there's a, a little familiarity, um, you know, defensively uh, because of what Pat does in playing them a few years ago. Um, but if I was to answer a question like that, I'd just be throwing a bunch of cliches at you. So a follow up maybe, was it a quick cleanup based on how thorough yesterday was? It's never a quick cleanup. You know, even in a game like that, uh, there's things that we need to do better. And there's things that we showed on film that Pitt's gonna see that if we don't get cleaned up, we're gonna get exposed. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, when you lose a game, the world is falling. And when you win a game, everything's perfect. And that's never the case. You know, there's games we've lost this year that we did some really good things and there's games we've won that we've really executed poorly. So, you know, when you come in on Sunday, you try to focus on the film and what you're coaching and not necessarily the result. Now, everything obviously is against the backdrop of the result and we're happy with the result, uh, but there's still a lot of things that we need to coach and get better at uh, to beat a team as, as good as Pitt on Saturday. Next question is Luciano Chatelain. Go ahead with your question. Hey, coach, I hope you're doing well and thanks for your time. What lessons that your team may have learned from your losses against UNC and Clemson would, would you say might help you the most to win the conference championship? And would you say that your chances to win this game would have been any different if you had reached this instance still undefeated? Well, I mean, we, we lost to two teams. Uh, on the road that were both preseason top 10 and very talented teams. And I don't know if it's anything we learned in those games. I think we turned the ball over three times in those games. So it's really hard to win a football game when you turn the ball over three times. And yesterday we won the turnover margin three to one. We were plus 14 off of turnovers. Against Clemson, we were minus 14 on turnovers. And against Carolina, we were minus off of turnovers. So. It's not that complicated. You know, if you turn the ball over and, and give other teams short fields and you don't get stops, you're probably not gonna win games. And we're happy to be in the championship game. I mean, there's not, you know, how many undefeated teams are left? I think, what is it, one? So, um, you know, when the season started, our, our goal was to be in this game and, and then to win this game. 
and we accomplished the first part of it. Now our goal this week is to accomplish the second half of that. Next question is Brett Friedlander. And Brett. that leads, that leads kind of right into my question. Dave, you guys have been talking about good to great since the beginning of the season. What is it about this team that a lot of people, especially those outside the program, didn't see that helped you make that jump from good to great now that you're in the championship game? Brad, I've, I've coached for 33 years and I've been a head coach for 22 years. And I, I have a feeling when I have a good team. And I, I just really felt after going through COVID last year, uh, some of the leadership that I saw emerge, some of the progress the younger players made, uh, the way we executed during spring practice, uh, how much the players were engaged in the summer, how much extra time they were up in the offices. Um, I just really felt that this year we had a chance uh, to not just be good, but be really good. And I wouldn't have come up with that theme, good to great, if I didn't think we were capable of accomplishing that. So, you know, you throw something like out there, you set yourself up for ridicule if you go six and six. And again, not that, you know, we've won a bunch of close games, uh, but I, I just had a, a really good feeling about this football team, mainly because I felt great about the leadership of this team. And as a quick follow-up, how, how much did, I think you had nine super seniors come back that got the extra year of eligibility. How much did that help in, in that area? Well, it, it helped, you know, but two of them didn't play at all. Uh, you know, two of them on the O-line were out with season ending injuries. And uh, so we ended up playing seven of them. And, you know, we, we have 54 of our scholarship players, Brett, are, are freshmen. So this whole portrayal of, boy, no wonder Wake's good. You know, they've got a bunch of 26 and 27 year old guys. Um, you know, we have some, but that's not accurate. We're still in some places a very young football team. We've just got a good balance. We've got a good balance of, of older guys that have been there that are being very proactive leaders for us and younger guys to their credit who are following the leadership. Thanks a lot, David. Oh, you're welcome. Our next question is David Teal. Go ahead, David. Dave, where did you and Warren first connect? Was it when he was at Hofstra and you were at Fordham, or was there a different connection? Uh, well, there, there was a uh, – when he was at Hofstra and I was at Fordham, we used to go – I used to go over and visit the New York Giants all the time when Sean Payton was the offensive coordinator. And a lot of times I'd run into Warren um, and, uh, you know, always Warren's offenses at Hofstra were always very productive. And then when I was at Richmond, I was the head coach and Warren was the offensive coordinator at Hofstra and he just drove us nuts. Um, he just had an answer to everything we would do. Um, and so he was somebody I always uh, admired. Uh, how he game planned, how he called plays. He always had productive quarterbacks. And when I was at Fordham and I was at Richmond, I was the head coach and the quarterback coach and the offensive coordinator. And when I went to Bowling Green, I just, it was too much to be the head coach at that level and also be the play caller. But I wanted to hire a guy that had familiarity with the system that I grew up in and Warren had worked for a guy, Pete Lembo, who kind of knew the Lehigh West Coast uh, nomenclature terminology that we used. And, uh, and so I asked Warren if he'd be interested in coming up and uh, small world, his wife was from Defiance, Ohio, which was a half an hour from Bowling Green. And, uh, you know, a lot of times if your wife wants to move somewhere, you end up moving there. And uh, so that, you know, was where Warren and I connected and he did a great job for us at Bowling Green and uh, was fortunate enough that he wanted to come here uh, and work together some more. And it's been a really good partnership. And after 12 years together now, is it just, you, you know each other so well that you can just delegate it to him and there's not even a lot of words anymore? Well, it's not always that simple. I mean, we're both very competitive people and, 
you know, Warren is not a yes man at all. Um, you know, there's, there's sometimes that we have very healthy disagreements, but one thing about Warren is anything that he says or wants to do is always in the best interest of our football program. And so that's the one thing I love about Warren is, you know, he, he wants to win. He wants to win the right way. Uh, you know, we don't always agree, but I trust him implicitly. Uh, He's been a great developer of quarterbacks. I mean, you look at, you know, what we're doing and the string of quarterbacks we've had here and, you know, Warren's developed John Wolford, Jamie Newman, and now Sam Hartman. And I don't think it's an accident. He can evaluate, he can coach, he can develop. And he tweaks our offense a little bit every year. Uh, to the average fan, things look the same. If you're a defensive coordinator, you know that they're different. Our next question is from Andrea Adelson. Andrea, go ahead. Hey, Dave. Um, as a follow-up to what you were talking about with Brett, it's it's one thing to know you have a good team. It's another to know whether you have a championship team. I'm, I'm wondering um, whether there was a point in time, either during the season or in the preseason, where you thought to yourself, we really have the capability of being able to win an ACC championship this year. I mean, that, that's the goal every year. Um, and, you know, when we went into the season, you know, I said this to the staff, you know, we've been really good. We've been consistent. We've been the five consecutive bowls, but we didn't ever have that one breakout season. And I, I said to the staff before the season, I go, I don't want to put pressure on us, but I really believe if we're going to have that breakout year, this year is our best opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of guys back, you know, I always thought 20 was going to be our toughest season, even without COVID because we had graduated so many players off of the 19 team that I always thought if we could survive 20, we had a really good chance to be good in 21. And then getting some of those super seniors back even made, I think it, it better for us. Uh, so, you know, do you have a championship team? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, to, to have a year like this, I think you have to be good. And you also have to be a little bit fortunate and that fortune comes in, in winning close games. And uh, I think we've won those close games because of our maturity, uh, because of our ability to execute. Uh, but, you know, you're also at, at times fortunate. There's always a, a kick that could hit a cross bar that doesn't. You know, there's an onside kick that could be kicked a half yard further. Uh, you know, I don't think as a coach, you ever know it. You just know that, okay, do you have enough this year that it's a possibility? And if it is, uh, you hope you can find ways to win those close games and be in this position. Is there one or a couple of guys who you weren't sure whether would be able to step up for you before the season started who have stepped up in maybe a larger way than you expected or anticipated? Absolutely. You know, losing Javionte Nash was a huge blow. And uh, Devontae Gordon has really played good football for us. Um, you know, because losing Javionte and Terrence Davis, that was the depth in the O-line. So we really thought Devontae would be our seventh or eighth offensive lineman this year. And he's had a great season for us. Uh, losing Donovan Green. I thought Donovan, along with Ja'Cory Roberson, was going to be one of the very best receivers in the ACC. And I expected a Torian Perry to be good, but he, he's exceeded my expectations for a first-year starter. Uh, you know, certainly we expected Sam to have a good year. And then on defense, there was a guy like Jasheen Davis, uh, who's a freshman who's starting for us that's playing at a really high level. And I think Brian Smend has gotten better. Uh, so yeah, they're across the board, I think everybody, the guys that came back who were good have elevated their play, but those would be the handful of guys that I think have really come through for us. Um, not in an unexpected way, but just maybe a level above what we thought. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Our next question is from Jerry DePaula. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks for your time, uh, Kevin and, and Dave. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Pat Narduzzi's defense, Dave, uh, is stop the run first, and maybe it puts a little pressure on the cornerbacks. 
What kind of special problems does it present for an offense? And what is your approach when you are, are trying to attack a, a defense like that? Well, Pat, uh, going back to his days at Rhode Island and Miami of Ohio and Cincinnati and Michigan State, and now Pitt has always been what you call a press quarters guy. Um, he's had excellent corners and he puts those guys on islands um, and they're good. And because of that, the safeties can get very involved with the run game. So you get, you know, a lot of eight and nine man boxes that you can't block them all. Um, and in the years that he has those really good corners, uh, it's tough to beat. So Pat is an excellent defensive strategist. Uh, you know, Randy Bates, who, again, I knew him when he was at New Hampshire back when I was at Lehigh. And uh and at Villanova, and at, you know he was at Northwestern, is an excellent defensive coach. And I think the combination of those two guys working together, uh, you know, you have two excellent defensive minds that have kind of created a system that is super aggressive. Uh, they don't concede anything; they make you execute. Uh, and you know, it's a lot like Clemson in that they're always attacking. You know, this is not a bend, but don't break defense. This is a, you know, we're going to get get up there and pressure you and, and force you to make difficult plays. Our next question is from John Dell. John, go ahead. Yeah, Dave, you mentioned uh, Luke. Um, you know, he's one of the guys that came back um, and switched positions a little bit, obviously, on the defense. But how much is his really his NFL stock rose this year by, by staying that extra year? I'm sure it's raised a lot. Um, you know, he's gone from a kind of an oversized safety to a, you know, 230, 235 pound linebacker that can run and hit and tackle and blitz. And boy, he played really, really well against BC. He was all over the field and, you know, he's a very valuable special teams guy. I mean, he's the guy at the next level that could start on all four units. Um, but he's just such a good leader, such a good person. Uh, we have a lot of guys like that, that you're just, you're proud to be their coach. And, and Luke is, he's top shelf. He really is in everything he does. We're fortunate to have him. Next question is from Les Johns. Les, go ahead. Hey, Dave, uh, my understanding is that you told uh, the team on Friday about your contract extension. Um, how did you tell them and, and what kind of reaction did you get? It was very matter of fact, Les, you know, I, I never, ever want this to be about me. And I want the attention to be on our team and our program. You know, so it wasn't one of those moments that I was going to find a video of Leonardo DiCaprio saying I'm staying and put my face on it and dancing around. Um, to me, it was just very matter of fact uh, that, you know, I had planned on hopefully signing an extension when the season was over uh, because of how well our players have played. Uh, you know, there were certain rumors that I might be going here, there, or somewhere else. And I did not want an announcement of my extension before the season because I thought that would be a distraction. And I really didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to focus on the season. But then when these rumors kept coming up that I was going to somewhere else, uh, it started impacting recruiting. Other coaches were using it against us. And some coaches on our staff shared with me that players uh, had asked them about it. And I, I just thought the, you know, the distraction of the players thinking I might be leaving was outweighing the distraction of announcing an extension. So I just simply grabbed them before a team meal and said, uh, you know, guys, I know there's all these things out there. I just want you to know I'm planning on staying at Wake Forest. Uh, if that's good news to you, please don't tweet about it. Uh, if you're upset about that news, please at least wait till Monday before you go in the portal. Let's focus on BC. We have time for about two more questions. Anybody have, I'll have a question. Oh, real we'll quick, to, real quick, I got one. Um, go ahead, unless I missed it, Dave, uh, how did your, uh, your father become a Pitt fan? You guys are from Youngstown, New York, is that right? 
Yeah, but my dad's from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Okay, all right. Uh, he played uh, he played basketball at UPJ, and then he transferred to Pitt, and he gra- his undergraduate degrees from Pitt. And then in that time of life that you become a huge sports fan, I lived in a little town called St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. And every year, my dad would take me to a Pirates game, a Pitt Panther football game, and a Pittsburgh Steeler football game. And we used to go to old Pitt Stadium and, you know, in Oakland and the traffic cop that would point guys into restaurants. Uh, and I just grew up being a huge Pitt Panther fan. And I'd, I'd listen to their games on the radio. Uh, and again, grew up, you know, a huge Matt Cavanaugh fan. And, you know, I remember when Tony Dorsett changed the name to Tony Dorsett. Uh, and just again, grew up a huge uh, Pitt Panther football fan. That that was the team that engaged me in college football. And uh, again, my dad, uh, you know, he was a Pitt Panther through and through. And so our whole family grew up as Pitt Panther fans. And uh, you know, in the last eight years, that's changed a little bit. Thank you, yep. John Dell. Looked like you had a question or. Yeah, David, just wanted to ask you, I know your parents live in Charlotte. Um, how big is that, you know, to try and get them tickets and all that good stuff? I mean, is that something you'll uh, let Catherine decide on? Uh, well, she makes all, all major decisions in our house. Um, I told my parents that they'd, they'd have, I'd have tickets for them. So, and, and I think my dad will be wearing Wake Forest gear for this one. All right, thank you everybody. And thank you, Coach. Clawson for joining us. We will talk to you again uh, later this week on Friday. Yeah, when's your when's your interview with Pat? He is right after you. If you guys could all do me a favor and keep him on there for at least 45 minutes, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> <Best>. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks.